following is a presentation of Chris Ann Hall as she was touring through Indiana speaking on the topic of nullification, particularly of Obamacare, but also of federal overreach in general. Tonight, she was speaking at the War County Tea Party, located in Boonville, Indiana. They hold their meetings the third Tuesday of each month at 6.30 at the American Legion Post. The public is always welcome to attend. We hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. Thank you for listening.
and make some difference in government, we are fooling ourselves. Because we go up there and we make a big show, and then the next day we're gone and they've totally forgotten why we were there or we were even there to begin with. And you know, and then CNN and MSNBC will tell you we weren't there to begin with. We have got to get focused on solutions. And what I'm giving you tonight is the solution, the right now solution that will fix this federal government from this day forward. Now, how many of you realize we didn't get to this position overnight? We've been running down this hill for a very long time. And we're not going to get back overnight. There's no magic incantation. I don't have a beautiful little blue pill to give you that will make things all better. Do you, how many of you realize that it's a whole lot more work to go uphill than it is to go downhill? Okay. We've been running downhill for decades. We have to now get back up that hill. It's more work. It's going to take more time. But that doesn't mean we don't have to go do it. we got to get back up to the top. We can't be resigned to sit at the bottom. And so this is what I want to give you tonight. This is the remedy for our federal government overreach. Now the first thing that we must acknowledge is that we have three branches of government, right? We have the legislative branch in Congress. We have the executive branch and the president, and we have the third branch. What's the third branch? The judicial branch. So if we start off right now understanding that the judicial branch is part of the federal government, can we agree with that? Okay, we're ahead of the game already. And what we need to understand is that, and I don't know, can you people they're going to have to see this, so we're going to have to get that down there. Yeah, is that better? Yes. All right, because you're going to have to see that. All right, so where am I going to stand to get out of your way? we got to understand that these three branches of government have failed us. Okay? Our conservative Republican House has handed more power to this president that he has stolen on his own right. in right. the name of national security. Every mechanism set in place for the enforcement of just how bad this health care is going to get has already been passed by our conservative Republican House who has been in the habit of ignoring the Constitution. I don't know if you, if you uh, realize this or you, or you recognize this, because it didn't get much media play. But just a few weeks ago, it may be a month or so ago now, time has no meaning to me anymore, 134 of our conservative Republicans voted that the Fourth Amendment doesn't need to apply to the federal government if they have a national security interest. All the NSA spying on the people are reading our emails and taking our cell phone conversations. Justin Amash put forward an amendment to defund the NSA from spying on American people. That's all it was. It was a very narrowly tailored bill. But those who want to keep that power on both sides of the fence spun it out of control and made it something that it wasn't. I got to watch a town hall meeting where Michelle Bachman said that she was vehemently opposed to Justin Amash's amendment to stop the NSA from spying on us because she said, your emails and your cell phone conversations don't belong to you. They belong to your email provider and your cell phone company. And since they belong to those people, the government taking them is not violating your Fourth Amendment. They're simply requesting business records from these, from these companies. Your, your email conversations and your cell, or your email letters and your cell phone conversations in the eyes of 134 Republicans are not yours. They're the business records of those companies. Not only that, 
She came out and said the only people that would benefit from this limitation of the Fourth Amendment on the federal government would be Islamic jihadists. So the only people that benefit from the government being bound by the Fourth Amendment, that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects shall not be infringed, the only people that benefit from that enforcement are Islamic jihadists. How many of you are familiar with the National Defense Authorization and Definite Detention Provisions? Yeah? Where the government can indefinitely detain U.S. citizens based on the executive branch's definition of who a terrorist is and what a hostility is. Not only that, the Section 4 waivers in those provisions allow the executive branch to transfer the powers guaranteed to the military under the laws of war, transfer that power to the Department of Homeland Security. Mm. So that the Department of Homeland Security now carries all the power that the military does under the laws of war, and we don't need a declaration of war, we need a declaration of a hostility. Anybody want to tell me what a hostility is? Because they didn't bother to find that in the act. Do you know, do you know who helped write that act? Alan West. Alan West is not a friend to the Constitution. Alan West has voted against the Constitution nearly every opportunity that he's had. Alan West did not lose his position in Florida because of gerrymandering or voter fraud. Alan West lost his position in Florida because the Florida Tea Parties got a picture of his voting record and stopped voting for him. Congress, I'm just trying to show you, our Congress has <coughs> failed us. Do I have to give you examples of how the executive branch failed us? <laughs> Don't have all that. How about the judicial branch? Do we need any further? I mean, they have been failing us since 1803. Since 1803, when the, when, the, when the Supreme Court, in a decision called Marbury versus Madison, declared themselves the supreme rulers of the universe. And it's been all downhill since then. So when the, when the federal government has failed the Constitution, and there is no recourse in the federal system, the states must now defend the republic. It is incumbent upon our states to understand that there is a proper role of government. There is a hierarchy in government. And it goes like this. People at the top, states, and then federal. The federal government was supposed to have the least power and the least influence on the lives of the people. And oh, how we have shifted that paradigm. Yeah. Why? Because we simply do not understand the very basics. So we're going to get back to the basics. Now we know that the Declaration of Independence was written on July 4th, 1776. But we do not teach that we were actually on our way to being independent a month prior. June 7, 1776, the framers presented at the, Con at the Continental Congress the Lee Resolution. Now the Lee Resolution presented to the Congress by a man named Richard Henry Lee was a three-step process for declaring independence. So our Declaration of Independence wasn't a bunch of rogue rebels who woke up one morning with a headache from too much beer and fish and chips the night before and decided to go rogue. This was a, legis a legal action as created by this legislative action called the Lee Resolution. Step number one, we are 13 independent sovereign states. Now I want you, if you're taking notes or you're taking mental notes, keep in mind that word state. Because I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't mean what you think it means. Thirteen independent sovereign states. Step number two. As thirteen independent sovereign states, we're declaring our independence from Great Britain, we must 
gather foreign alliance to help overthrow Great Britain. Because you see, they had just become 13 little bitty independent states. They did not have the money or the resources to kick out the most powerful government in the world. You ever heard the saying, the sun never set on the British Empire? Okay. So they did not have the capability of doing that on their own. They knew they had to get some foreign friends to do that. Step number three, we must form a confederation. Not a consolidation, but a confederation. Why? Why was that so important? Well, they had just become 13 independent sovereign states that will have just bankrupted themselves, that will have just gone into debt to foreign nations and invited foreign troops on their soil to help kick out Great Britain. And they had to come together in a union as a show of safety in numbers. Because you see, if they didn't come together and say, we are united in this, once the revolution was over, they would have no power to kick out the allies that had occupied them to help defeat Great Britain. I mean, we can't think that France and Spain were helping us with our independence simply because they were a bunch of nice guys. They're looking to get something out of this. They're looking for some territory. Real estate's what they want, and if they can get a one that's already colonized, how much greater will that be? So we gotta come together as a union in order to kick out our friends when we're done. Three-step process. From that three-step process, remember, now, in June, of seven, June 7, 1776, we are 13 independent sovereign countries, states already. So the states existed prior to the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence was simply a declaration of what we have done. Okay? We then moved to the Articles of Confederation. You, uh, how many of you know that our Constitution was not the first, our current Constitution was not the first Constitution, right? George Washington was not the first president. He's simply the first president under this more perfect union. Now, we created the Articles of Confederation, and they did not work. Interestingly enough, they created a federal government so small that it couldn't function. Now, that in and of itself should defeat any argument that our framers, that the progressives like to put forth, that, that our framers were trying to build a large centralized government. They just didn't know what they were doing, and we got to finish it for them. The truth of the matter is, they went so small, because that's what they wanted, that they created a federal government that couldn't work. They couldn't collect taxes to do what they were supposed to do. They couldn't force the delegates to come to work. Not only that, they had some misunderstandings in certain aspects of the federal government's power. For example, the federal government's power was to be in foreign affairs. We created the federal government to be a foreign diplomat on behalf of the states, a representative of the states to foreign countries. And in that, the federal government is, was delegated the power to create treaties. Treaties of commerce, treaties of peace, treaties of war, that sort of thing. But they were having a problem because the federal government was creating inequitable treaties. So what was happening is they were, for example, making a commercial treaty with France. And in this commercial treaty with France, New York would gain all the benefit and New North Carolina would fit the bill. So North Carolina's not happy about this treaty because they're paying all the expense and New York is getting all the benefit. So what was happening is North Carolina and New York are fighting, right? Because North Carolina says, we're not honoring this treaty. Not only are we fighting amongst the states, but when North Carolina uh, refuses to honor that treaty, you now have the foreign country that we've made the treaty with angry at us. So we were literally on the verge of foreign war and on the verge of a war between the states because the federal government did 
didn't understand the purpose of its job. The purpose of its existence, actually. And so when the Articles of Confederation, when they decided to dissolve those, they created the more perfect union. Now, I want you to turn to your pocket constitutions to the Declaration of Independence. Because this is very important, very, very important to understand. And I need to make sure that you can see this and not just rely on what's on the board. So if you have a pocket constitution that looks like this, is that what she's handing out, though? Okay. Turn to page 38. If you go to page 38, you'll see the bottom paragraph starts with, We therefore. Say amen if you got it. Amen. All right. <laughs> This is where we're going to understand something that we have failed to understand for a very long time. That word state, like, what state am I in? Indiana? I, 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 I don't know. I just flew in yesterday from Minnesota. And in Minnesota, I taught in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. So, and when I leave here, I go to Washington State before I go home. So, we are going to learn what state really means. And it does not mean Indiana, Illinois, Florida, Georgia. Look at what it means. Ready? We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and, the, and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare what they'd already done in the Lee Resolution, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. Now, not Indiana, Illinois, Florida, Georgia, but look at what they are. That they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the what? State. Of Great Britain. Great Britain. That word state does not mean Indiana, Illinois, Florida, Georgia. That word state means Great Britain, France, Spain, Germany. It literally means country. We didn't, be, we didn't become 13 little pieces of a union. We became 13 independent, sovereign countries. Amen. Now, you don't have to believe because we're going to go on and read a little bit further. And that, that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, listen to the power that they have. They have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states, not Indiana, Illinois, Florida, Georgia, but Germany, Spain, and Greece, all other acts and things which independent countries may of right do. In June 7, 1776, July 4, 1776, reaffirming, we became 13 independent sovereign countries bearing the same, owning the same power as Germany, France, and Great Britain. And I just want to let you know, nothing has changed since July 4, 1776 to change that. The Constitution does not change that. The Constitution reaffirms that. We did not become a consolidation we became a confederation. We became a union of countries, not a dissolving, bordered nation, federal nation. Now look, let me give you an example, a modern day example. Do we not have a European Union? Right? So I'm going to tell you what. You go fly to Germany. And you tell the people of Germany and their leaders, because they are members of the European Union, that they are not sovereign and independent countries. How well do you think that's going to go over? Why do we buy into that now? For us, we are no different. 
Now you don't have to believe me because I'm going to show you. The Articles Confederation, which immediately have followed the Declaration, Article 2 of the Articles Confederation is the precursor to our Tenth Amendment. And it reads, each state retains its sovereignty and freedom and independence. And every power and jurisdiction and right, which is not by this confederation, confederation, right? Not consolidation. This confederation expressly, what is that word there? Delegated, Delegated to the United States. Delegated. Now let's just sort of lay this out here. Does that word delegated mean the same thing as surrender? No, it does not. It is very different. Now we keep this. Now there are people who love, especially our progressive friends, love international law. They want us all to be subject to international law, and they will say that we need to be a global nation. Okay? So when they tell you that, because we need to be a global nation, and that international law means that we are all just part of the United States and not independent, you can show them the Treaty of Paris. Because the Treaty of Paris is still valid international law, which, which recognizes, his Britannic Majesty acknowledges, that the said United States are free, sovereign, and independent states. Not Indiana, Illinois, France, Spain, and Great Britain. Now, the nature of our republic there are some things that we have to understand. What is the difference between a kingdom and a republic? Because that's what we started off with, right? Before the Declaration of Independence, we were subjects to a king. So what is the difference between a kingdom and a republic? In a kingdom, the king holds all the power and hands out the rights as he sees fit. In a republic, the people hold all the rights and delegate the power to government as they see fit. Remember, the, the Declaration of Independence says that the, go the government receives its just powers from the consent of the governed. Right? And so, the nature of our republic is that we created a union through a contract. The Constitution is a contract. How many of you have heard that? Now, technically speaking, it's a compact because it's between countries. A contract between governments is called a compact. A contract between people is called a contract. Now, legally speaking and how the law applies, there is no difference. We just call them different names to recognize that one is between governments and one is between people. And so the United States are united, the states are united in a compact. Through this contract, they created the central government. Now you might hear sometimes, and you may hear more often as we start moving towards this federal government wanting to seize even more power from the states, that the Constitution is a contract between the people and the federal government. Or they may even try to get closer to the truth and say the Constitution is a compact between the states and the federal government. That is a temporal impossibility. It is impossible for the federal government to be a party to the Constitutional Compact. Why? Because they didn't exist until the Constitution was ratified. You cannot be a party to a contract when you are the product of the contract. Because you don't exist until the contract is signed, so you can't sign the contract to make yourself exist. So the, the states created the central government through this constitutional contract, and the states are the parties to the contract. Now this is very, very important for us to hang on to, because when you go read the words of the framers in what they intended when they created this government, they will quite often, and you will see some quotes this evening, refer to the state, not by the word state, but by the words sovereign parties to the compact. 
And so when you see that, the sovereign parties to the compact, we know they're talking about the states. Okay? Now, the states are the creators of the central government. In that creation, they enumerated its specific powers, creating a limited government and reserving all the rest of the power to themselves. Because remember, July 4th, 1776, we declared ourselves to be independent, sovereign countries with every single power that every other country on the planet held. And through the Constitution and creating this limited government, we enumerated specific and limited powers, reserving all the other powers to themselves. How do we know this? The Tenth Amendment says so. <coughs> the powers, not, remember that word powers right there, right? That's not rights. Powers. I know you have heard that the Constitution is a list of negative rights for the government. Now, I'm an attorney. I have no idea what a negative right <laughs> is. But I'm sure, since we have a government that likes to redefine the meaning of is, they can come up with something. But the bottom line is, negative or positive, we didn't give any rights to the government. We only delegated power. Now this is important because this is the Tenth Amendment, but as you learn in my workshop, if you get to come to the workshop on Saturday, you learn in my workshop that the Ninth Amendment declares that all the rights in the universe belong to us, the people. We, remember, we're a public. All the rights belong to the people, and we delegate power to the government. So the powers not delegated to the United States are what? Reserved to the states or to the people. Why? Or to the people? Because all the rights belong to us. The power emanates from rights. So we, even when we delegate power to government, we still own them. Right? Let me put it to you this way. If I'm the manager of Chick-fil-A, and I delegate the power to one of my employees to make fries, okay? You are the fry guy. I'm delegating you to the power to make fries. The fry guy comes in one day and says, sorry, I don't feel like making fries today. I'm not making any fries. As the manager of that Chick-fil-A, am I out of luck for fries that day? No. Can't I find someone else to make the fries? Is it illegal for me to hire someone else to make fries? Maybe if I have a union, but that's not what we're talking about here, right? Because I've not surrendered the power to make fries, I have delegated the power to make fries. And so if the federal government fails to complete a power or a job that is, comes from the power that we've delegated to them, are we out of luck? No. Because we have not surrendered that power, we've not given that power, we have merely delegated it, we have temporarily assigned a power to perform a function. Temporarily. And we have said all the power comes from the people. The government, uh, um, the government receives its just powers from the consent of the government. And if the states fail to do it, it's our responsibility because we delegated it to them. The, de the states <coughs> delegated the power to the federal government. If the federal government fails, it falls back on them. But wait a minute. How do we know? Well, let me, I'll get ahead of myself. Okay. Noticing that the powers are delegated, this implies a source. The source must be the states. How do we know this? James Madison said in Federalist Papers 45, the powers delegated to the federal government are few and defined. Those that remain in the states are numerous and indefinite. He said the powers delegated to the federal government through the Constitution are for external objects. And then he names them. War, peace, negotiation, foreign commerce. That's all your federal government has been power, empowered to do. War, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Because that's the very specific power.
powers that were enumerated in the Declaration of Independence, right? They have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, and establish commerce. And do all the other things. But these specific powers, being specifically enumerated, are the ones that our framers specifically delegated to the federal government. So if we know through the Declaration of Independence that these powers originally rested in the states, then it must mean that the states are the delegators of that power, right? Okay. When the power comes from the people, we have a republic. But when the power comes from the government, we have a kingdom. The powers delegated by the proposed constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the states, look at that, remain in the states because the rest started with the states, we just delegated them, are numerous and indefinite. The former, meaning the powers for delegated to the federal government, will be exercised principally on external objects as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. The powers reserved to the several states will extend to, what's this three little magic, three letter word there? All. All. What does all mean? Everybody. All, right? Still today, all means all. All the objects which, in the ordinary course of affairs, concern the lives, liberties, properties, and the people, and the external order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. So, if we have delegated war, peace, negotiation, foreign commerce to the federal government, and reserved everything else to the states, is there any power sort of floating around in the ether waiting for somebody to pick it up? No. It's either this or everything else. Okay? So, the federal powers are few and enumerated, the state powers are numerous and reserved, there are no gaps. Which means, if the federal government is doing more than war, peace, negotiation, foreign commerce, doing more than foreign affairs, what has to happen? They have to steal that power from the states. Right? So let me ask you something. If I steal your car, do I have the legal authority to sell it? No, of course not. Do you have to sue me to get your car back? No. You simply show your title deed, proof of ownership of that car, and you take it. The poor guy who bought the stolen car from me is the one who has to get compensated for his loss. So, if the federal government is stealing power from the states, does it have a lawful authority to use it? No. We have to remember some of these basic things. The purpose of the Constitution was not to create the federal government. The purpose of the Constitution as the preamble says, is to preserve the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. We simply chose government as a mechanism to do that. So the purpose of the Constitution is to preserve liberty. We created a union of the states to preserve liberty. And we created and defined a limited federal government to preserve liberty. This is not opinion. This is fact. You go read what they said, and they told, they will tell you time and time again, we are focused on liberty. <coughs> focused on liberty. They said time and time again, the fact that we were able to come together and actually achieve this Constitution was a miracle because we were focused on liberty. John Adams said, liberty must be supported at all hazards. Notice he didn't say health care. <laughs> but guess what? He didn't say Social Security either. Or Medicaid, or Medicare, or your house, your job, your car, your cell phone, or your vacation. He said liberty must be supported at all hazards. Because he knew without liberty, you'd have nothing. But what is liberty? We don't even know that anymore. Because we run around going, freedom!
freedom, freedom, freedom. We must have freedom. But freedom and liberty are not the same thing. And if truth be told, we don't want to live in a country based on freedom. Because if we live in a country whose foundational principle is freedom, that means I'm free to lie, I'm free to steal, I'm free to murder. I am free to do whatever I want to do regardless of how that hurts you. That's not a nice place to live. That's anarchy. Not yet. Freedom and liberty are not the same thing. Liberty is freedom plus morality. That shared morality that says, I am free to lie, I'm free to steal, and I'm free to murder. But I won't because it's wrong. Can I tell you something that will make your legislators mad? Laws don't stop crimes. <laughs> no. Laws don't stop crimes. The criminal justice system was not even designed to stop crimes. The criminal justice system is designed to identify criminal activity and punish criminals. And make jobs. And make jobs. Yeah. And make government rich through probation programs. Two things, only two things that will stop your neighbor, stop a man from murdering his neighbor. Because he is free to murder his neighbor anytime he wants to. Two things, ready? One, I am free to murder my neighbor anytime I want, but I won't but it's because it's wrong. Two, I'm free to murder my neighbor anytime I want, but I won't because he's well armed. <laughs> government to preserve the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. So let me ask you this question, keeping in mind everything that we've just learned. If the federal government is def not defined by the Constitution, why did we have a Constitution? Why didn't our framers just come together and add on to what they had, the five documents that made their constitutional liberty secure? Why didn't they just add on to that and say, okay, government, do what you want, and then when we don't like where you're going, we'll just start chopping off heads. Because that's what we've been doing for the last thousand years, and there's really no reason to change that. So if it's not defined by the Constitution, then what is the purpose of the Constitution? But listen, if the federal government is not limited in its power by the Constitution, what is the limit of the government's power? Jefferson said, they will view this as a seizing of the rights of the states, consolidating them in the hands of the general government with a power assumed to bind the states, not merely in cases made federal. The cases that they made federal, the actual powers delegated, war, peace, negotiation, foreign commerce, what they had the power to bind them to, he says, not only will they bind us where we grant, we delegated them power, but in all cases whatsoever. Now you need to know these words. These words, in all cases whatsoever, were not simply words to the people of 1776. Those words infuriated them. It inflamed their hearts and made them want to fight. Because those words, in all cases whatsoever, were the actual cause of a revolution. Our revolution was not about taxes. It was not a bunch of guys dressed as Indians screaming taxed enough already. Okay? It was a bunch of guys dressed as Indians screaming tyrannized enough already. You see, British Parliament had passed what they called a declaratory act. And this is part of the history that I will be teaching on Saturday. The declaratory act that said we can enforce any law on you that we want because you are subjects to the crown of Great Britain. So stop complaining. And in that declaratory act, they said that Parliament had the full right and power of sufficient force to bind the colonies, subjects of the crown of Great Britain, in all cases whatsoever. So what he was telling
telling you here is that if we allow the federal government to define its own power, we no longer have a republic. We are back to a kingdom. Right. He says, this would be to surrender the form of government we have chosen and live under one deriving its power from its own will and not from our authority. What is our authority? The Constitution. So when the Constitution does not limit the federal government, then the only thing that limits it is its own will. So, a federal government not limited by the people, a federal government whose only limitation is its own will, is not a republic, it is a totalitarian kingdom. James Madison said in 1798, for the federal government to enlarge its powers by forced construction of the constitutional charter, which defines them so as to destroy the meaning and the effect of the particular enumeration. Say, in why in heaven's name did we enumerate specific powers? Then we're just going to let them figure it out on their own? He said the result of that would be to transform the present Republican system of the United States into an absolute or at best monarchy. So what does this mean, forced construction of the constitutional charter? Forced construction means the general welfare clause. Because the general welfare clause does not mean what our government says it means. Do you remember I told you one of the reasons that the Articles of Confederation failed was because of these inequitable treaties, right? The General Welfare Clause was placed into the Constitution to remedy the inequitable treaties. The General Welfare Clause was placed into the Constitution to remind the federal government that when they created treaties or any negotiations with foreign governments, they could not do it to benefit one state and detriment the other. They had to make those treaties be for the general welfare of the entire union. It had to benefit everyone equally. And this is what James Madison said in 1792. Now this is what has happened. In 1792, the British government has come and stolen all our codfish off the coast. So we got together in 1792 to pass legislation to authorize our Navy to protect our coasts and to keep the British government from stealing all our codfish. But someone, some legislators, started shoving pork in this bill. We didn't invent that. <laughs> and the pork was this. Well, our cod fishermen have been severely damaged by the threat of uh, by, by the theft of Great Britain. And since our cod fishermen have been in the industry have been so damaged by this, we need to now subsidize our cod fishermen to bring them back whole because of Great Britain stealing our codfish. James Madison said it's not the duty of the federal government to subsidize industries. That is not why we created them. He says, I, sir, have always conceived, I believe, those who propose the Constitution conceived, and it is still more fully known and more material to, to observe that those who ratified the Constitution conceived that this is not an indefinite government, but a limited government tied down to specific powers which explain and define the general terms. What he's saying is, this general welfare clause does not mean that the government can do generally whatever they want. It is not a description of their power. It is the description of the purpose of their power. The reason we delegated this power, so we would have one voice speaking for the welfare of the entire union. Think about it. What's the point of having a union if we make a treaty with France and they have to make 50 treaties with 50 different agreements and 50 different currencies? We created a federal government to be a single voice for the union in foreign affairs. And the General Welfare Clause was supposed to let the 
federal government. No, the purpose for us delegating that power to you is so that you will be work on behalf of the whole government of the, all the states and not just one or the other. It doesn't mean you can generally do whatever you want. But then Madison continues and says, okay, you want to give up that purpose of the general welfare policy? You want to make it mean the federal government can do generally whatever it wants to do? Then there are consequences for that that you cannot avoid. And he says, these are the consequences. If Congress can employ money indefinitely to the general welfare and are the sole supreme judges of the general welfare, they may take care of religion into their own hands. They may appoint teachers in every state, county, parish, and then pay them out of their public treasury. They may take into their own hands the education of our children, establishing life better curriculums throughout the Union. They may assume provisions for the poor. They may undertake the regulation of all roads other than post roads, and in short, everything from the highest object of state legislation down to the most minute object of police would be thrown under the power of Congress. For every object I have mentioned would admit the application of money and might be called, if Congress so pleased, provisions for the general welfare. And Madison said that if we can do forced construction, make that general welfare clause mean that the government can do generally whatever it wants, we will have destroyed the meaning and effect of our enumerations and we will be creating an absolute or at best mixed monarchy. <coughs> So what do we do? Because I promised you, this was not simply about problems and pointing fingers. This is about solutions. We have to seek our answers from the creators of the Constitution. Now you're already going to meet some opposition. Because we live in a society today that think that the framers are irrelevant to the understanding of the Constitution. They're just a bunch of dead, rich, white guys who hated everybody but themselves and their money. And since they're dead and they couldn't have possibly known what we are seeing today, their opinions are irrelevant. Problem is, that violates every principle of law. The Constitution is a contract. And every law student in this country, although we are not taught the Constitution, we are all taught contract law. And in Contract Law 101, we learn that when there is a misunderstanding in, the, in a contract, a provision in the contract that seems ambiguous, or a provision in the contract that you're not quite sure how it applies, the remedy to that question is not to just make it up. The remedy to that question is to return to a point in the life of that contract called the meeting of the mind. That is a legal term. The meeting of the minds is when the people who created the contract sat down at a table and discussed what they want. It's where their minds met and agreed and they put it down on paper. Contract Law 101 says you have to return to the meeting of the minds. The Constitution is a contract. It has a meeting of the minds. And it's written down in all of the notes of the debates, all of the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist papers, all the letters, all the debates that took place in the public forum and in the private forum are the meeting of that minds. Do you know what is ironic? The Constitution is the only contract in the United States where judges and courts refuse to follow contract law. So we are now going to go to the meeting of the minds. <clears throat> Jefferson said that whenever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. Why? Because if I steal your car, do I have the power to sell it? So if the federal government steals powers, undelegated powers, <coughs> does, it have the po does it have the authority to use those powers? No, they're void and of no force. In the case, Madison says, in the case of deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted, who? The states have the right and are in duty bound to interpose.
grows. Why the states? Because the states are the original owners of that power. The states are the ones that delegated to the fry guy the power to make the fries. And if the fry, if the fry guy isn't going to make his fries, and he wants to try to steal the power from the burger guy, <coughs> the manager is the one who's got to come in and take back that power, right? Because it's the only way that you will maintain real, uh, limits, authorities, rights, and liberties. What is interposition? Madison said it's the state's duty to interpose. Jefferson called no interposition nullification of the unauthorized acts of federal government. Now, we are well into this program. And this is the first time I have mentioned that word, nullification. And I want to teach you that because I did that on purpose. Nullification carries around a big black cloud because we have taught the wrong things for a very long time. We no longer understand the proper role of government. And people who want power don't like it. So if you use that word nullification, if you step right up to your state legislator and say, let's chat about nullification, doors are going to slam in your face. I'm telling you from experience, because I had to learn the hard way, okay? I'm, I'm very passionate about what I do. I don't know if you figured that out yet. I'm very passionate about what I do. I get very excited about what I learn. And for me, it seems just as clear and as plain as my face. And so I want to run out and tell everybody what I learned. Because it's just that simple. I went and addressed our Senate in Florida. They were having a committee, a Senate committee, on, on whether they should establish the health care exchanges or not. So I marched my little self up there and stood on the podium and gave them a good lecture, uh, educational lecture on state's obligations to interposition and nullification. Did not go over well. <laughs> I had one senator call me out. Now this is, this is probably the third time that I've actually spoken in front of our state legislators. So I'm sitting down, I've taken my turn, which it, there, it's on video. You can actually go see it. That part didn't go over so well either. Um, but when when we finally when I finally was done and I sat down and I'm sitting there, one senator attacked me. He said, "I don't know how these people can stand up and defend the Constitution like they do." Uh. <laughs> now he's a black man. He said, "Because after all, the Constitution made me three fifths of a man." And and my blood is boiling now because I know that's a lie. Right? I've written an article on my website, How the Constitution Ended Slavery, all the stuff that we're taught wrong, and one of the things that we're taught wrong is the three-fifths clause. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm boiling, and I'm thinking, just breathe in and breathe out. And then he looks at me and says, I don't know how Ms. Hall can defend the Constitution. After all, the Constitution denied women the right to vote. At which point in time, I lose control of all my faculties. Okay? I have, I have all my notes, all my purse, everything on my, on my lap. I stand up, everything falls to the floor because I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm like this, and I say, that is a lie, sir, and you are a liar. Which is completely out of order, right? Which incites the crowd around me to stand up and, you know, and, I, and they're yelling, and I don't know why they're yelling, and they're yelling because the security is coming after me. <laughs> <laughs> and the chairman's going, begging the gavel, order, order, Miss Hall, you're an attorney, you should know proper court etiquette. I said, okay, fine, then I object. Because <laughs> you see, the Constitution did not prevent women from voting. 
women had the right to vote from the very beginning of our, of our union. As a matter of fact, women voted in this country until 1807, when corrupt politicians on the state level, wanting to consolidate power in their friends, started messing with who could vote and who could not vote. Go read the 19th Amendment, and you'll see I'm telling you the truth. Because the 19th Amendment does not establish the right of women to vote. It recognizes that they have that right and says it can't be taken away. So don't come up with nullification. Now, this is the second thing that happened. After the Senate meeting, the Senate president, his name is Don Gates, came to the meeting. He wasn't there. He just came to make his little political hoo-ha, right? Or shake hands and kiss babies. I'd never met him before. Somebody introduced me to him. I said, Mr. Gates, I am so pleased to meet you. And I handed him my card. Oh, nice to meet you, Miss Hall. We're glad to meet you, too. At this point, he's looking at my card, and it says, Fiery Advocate for the Constitution. <laughs> and I said, I'm hoping you'll see more of me, Mr. Gates. Oh, that would be great, Miss Hall. Yeah. And I said, I want to come, and I want to address the Senate, and I want to talk to you guys about nullification. Nobody told me not to use that word. Because at that minute, he steps back from me and laughs. Ah, I guess, Miss Hall, the Supreme, he said, nullification, I guess the Supreme Court didn't get your memo. And I'm thinking, what? Who's he talking to? Because he was not being very nice. I said, my memo? I guess they didn't get Madison or Jefferson's memo either. He said, oh, Madison, huh? Talked to Madison lately? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I have. It's called the Federalist Papers, and maybe you ought to read them every now and again. <laughs> At which point, I think he figures out I'm not backing down easily. So he, start, he turns his back on me, starts mumbling and walking away, mumbling something about dead people and irrelevancy. And I'm, I'm just standing there thinking, this guy is an elected employee talking to a resident of the state of Florida like this. In front of all these people, he's the president of the Senate. Now, he is just about from me to you. And I said, Mr. Gates, he's walking out the door. I said, I thought you said you were a constitutional conservative Republican. Turned on his heels and pointed at me and said, I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution. I said, well, maybe it's about time you learned something about that document. <laughs> at which point, he realized something I didn't. I was not alone. There was a whole crowd behind me, some of them reporters. <laughs> so when this realization comes to his mind, he starts, oh, Miss Hall, I'd be happy to hear anything you've got to say. Just send me an email as he's walking out the door. So I did. This lesson that I'm giving you today is in writing on my website. And that's what I sent to him. And he sent me back an email telling me that anyone who believed and supported nullification ought to be shot or hanged. Oh. Now it went national, and the Huffington Post asked him about this. He laughed it off. He said, oh, of course I didn't mean we're going to start shooting and hanging people. I just wanted Miss Hall to know that we could disagree and still remain civil. <laughs> that falls in the category, I don't have to make this up, right? So, don't use that word nullification right away. What is nullification? Nullification is simply the declaration of the people and the states that the government is not our master. That the states and the people are the masters of the Constitution, and therefore the masters of the federal government, and we do not have to, and we will not comply with stolen power. That's all nullification is. The assertion of the rights of the people. Jefferson said it's the rightful remedy. That the several states who formed the Constitution, right, because they're the parties, being what? Sovereign and independent. This is 1799 way after the Union, and they're still sovereign and independent, have the unquestionable right to judge of its infractions. And that a nullification by those sovereignties, who are the sovereignties? The states. 
of all unauthorized acts done under the color of that instrument is the rightful remedy. Now, this is, since I am putting you on the battlefield, I am not here, let me just let you know I'm not here to entertain you, okay? I'm not here to put information in your brain and make it about two ounces heavier so when you leave you feel smart. I am arming troops with the truth so that you are ready to battle to maintain the republic and preserve the blessings of liberty. So I want you to know what you're going to see. Some will say no to nullification. There are three common no's to nullification. It's not in the Constitution. The Supreme Court said no. And the Supremacy Clause prohibits it. But the framers of our nation disagree with all of that, and I'm going to show you why. It's not in the Constitution. That's what they're going to say. But it is. Because you see, the Ninth Amendment says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. It literally means all the rights belong to the people, no matter where they come from. They belong to us and no one else. And the government can't define them or disparage them or do anything to take them away. Well, let's talk about these rights. Sam Adams said, among the natural rights of the colonists are these. First, a right to life. Secondly, to liberty. Thirdly, to property. Together, which is number four, with the right to support and defend them in the best manner possible. Nullification is that number four. Nullification is you supporting and defending your right to life, liberty, and property. Because if you do not nullify, the federal government then becomes in control of unlimited power over your life, liberty, and property. Because if you do not nullify, then the government is only controlled by its own will. So it is in the Constitution, it is the Ninth Amendment. Now, this is very important premise to understand before we get to the next question, or the next argument. The Supreme Court says no. Listen to what John Calhoun says in 1831. The doctrine which denies the states the right of protecting their reserve powers. Remember, Sam Adams says we have the right to support and defend our liberty. The, a doctrine that denies the states of protecting their reserve power, which would best in the general government. Now, this parenthetical is very important. He says, it matters not through which department. We have three departments in the federal government. We have the legislative branch in Congress, the executive branch in the president, and who? The judicial branch. The judicial branch is part of the federal government. And he's saying it doesn't matter whether it's the Congress taking, uh, violating separation of powers and denying the states their rights. It's not, it doesn't matter if it's the president issuing executive orders and denying the states their rights. And it doesn't matter if it's the judicial branch allowing the other two to do that. He says, if it vests in the general government the right of determining exclusively and finally the powers delegated to it, this doctrine is incompatible with the sovereignty of the states because if the federal government can tell the states what its powers are, then the states are no longer sovereign. They are subjects to the federal government, right? Because when the government hands out the rights, it's a kingdom. When the power comes up from the people, it's a republic. So if the federal government can tell the states what it can and cannot do, they are subjects to the federal government, and we no longer have a republic. And he says it is incompatible with the Constitution itself. To allow the federal government, through the judicial branch even, to determine what its own powers is, is like having a criminal in the courtroom and saying, hey, how you feel today, guilty or innocent? Because we're just going to go with it. Right? So, Jefferson will tell us, and Madison will tell us why 
the Supreme Court does not have the final say. Jefferson says the idea that the general government is the exclusive judge of the extent of its powers delegated to it stops nothing short of despotism. Since, right, if they're the exclusive judges, the discretion of those who administer the government and not the Constitution would be the measure of their powers. And if it's not the Constitution and it's the government's will, it's not a republic, it's a... Madison, now I love this, this uh, argument by Madison because he just pokes the Supreme Court right in the eye. He gets straight to the point. He says, if the decisions of the judiciary be raised above the authority of the sovereign parties to the Constitution. Who are the sovereign parties to the Constitution? The states. If the judiciary be raised above the authority of the states, dangerous powers not delegated may not only be usurped and executed by other departments, but that the judicial department also <coughs> may exercise or sanction dangerous powers beyond the grant of the Constitution. Consequently, that the ultimate right of the parties to the Constitution, who are the parties to the Constitution? States. That the ultimate right of the states to judge whether the compact has been dangerously violated must extend to violations by one delegated authority as well as by another, by the judiciary as well as by the executive or the legislature. The Supreme Court does not have the authority to determine what is constitutional or not. Marbury versus Madison does not give them that right because Marbury versus Madison is the Supreme Court saying that they have that right themselves. How is it that they can grant themselves a power that the states never granted them? Now this is my favorite argument, the Supremacy Clause prohibits it. Because I love this argument, if you hear this argument from your legislator, it just proves that they're illiterate. Because it really takes only a sixth grade reading level to understand this. Alexander Hamilton says in Federal 78, no legislative act, therefore, contrary to the Constitution, can be valid. I don't know how much more simple you can get than that. But look, he says the consequence of allowing a legislative act contrary to the Constitution to be valid would be to affirm that the deputy is greater than his principal, that the servant is above his master, and that the representatives of the people are superior to the people themselves. And that men by acting by virtue of powers may do not only what their powers do not authorize. Right? What we authorized? War, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. They'll do something besides war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. But he's saying if we let them do this long enough, they'll not only do things that they're not authorized to do, They'll do things that they're forbidden to do, like shall not be infringed. Because one dis small disregard for the Constitution births even greater disregard altogether. The Supremacy Clause reads, The Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, shall be the supreme law of the land, it doesn't say all acts of Congress are the supreme law of the land. It says only those that are made in pursuance to the Constitution. So if they are legislative acts contrary to the Constitution, legislative acts that do more than war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce, they are not the supreme law of the land. And Hamilton says they are invalid. That wasn't hard, was it? So what do we have to do? We have to get our governors and legislators to draft a resolution proclaiming the sovereignty of the state and the unconstitutionality of that federal power, asserting the state's duty to deny that power. Don Gates said the other day on the radio, oh, that nullification thing, all it is is rhetoric. No. Suing the Supreme Court is rhetoric. Because when you sue the government to the Supreme Court, you're asking the government to decide what its power is. Nullification is not rhetoric. Just because it's a resolution doesn't mean it's rhetoric. 
We have made resolutions rhetoric because we make stupid resolutions. But this resolution will have teeth because we're asserting a state's duty to deny that power. With that resolution comes the state standing up and saying, you will not enforce this law here, we will not enforce this law here, and we will not allow our citizens to comply. Because it is stolen power. Now look, the resolution is to be transmitted to the governors and the senators, or by the governor to the senators and the representatives, telling them what we're doing. We don't ask the House and the Senate for permission because they are our employees. We simply tell them what we're doing. Now I love this from the, the state, repre the state um, representatives of the state of Virginia, January 23rd, 1799. Unwilling to shrink from our representative responsibilities. What do you suppose in your capital your representative's responsibilities are? Well, here they are. Are you ready? To be the guardians of the state's sovereignty and to act under their oath to support and defend the United Constitution of the United States. That is the primary job description of your state capital. To defend the sovereignty of the state and the Constitution of the United States. And they said, it would be deceitful to that responsibility to not warn the citizens of federal encroachments. Now what comes first, the encroachment or the warning? <coughs> the warning, right? Because if the encroachment comes first, there's no use for a warning. We're not even getting the warnings. Our states are competing for encroachments. Please give us federal money. Please give us funds to do this and do that and the other. Pay for our Medicaid. Pay for our schools. Pay for our roads. Those are the encroachments that deny state sovereignty and destroy the limitations in the federal and the Constitution. And your states are supposed to be guarding you against that. Not only that, they said even though those encroachments sound good, right? Even though they're, disguised, they're clothed with the pretext of necessity, we must have national health care. If we don't have national health care, people are going to die. People are going to die anyway. National health care just puts the, in the hands of the government the decision of who dies, when, and where. But look at this one. Not only the pretext of necessity, but also disguised by the argument of expediency. You gotta pass the bill so we can read the bill. And they wrote this in 1799. Now this is the scary part. This is the part where you learn something that no one is teaching you and I don't know why. They said, if we give in to all of this, what we're doing is establishing a precedent which may ultimately devote a generous and unsuspicious people to all the consequences of usurped power. All the consequences of usurped power. Do you know the danger of this Health Care Act has very little to do with the economy? Very little to do with your health care. The danger of the Health Care Act is the power that it vests in the federal government. Now our Supreme Court has said that the federal government can trump any one of our enumerated rights as long as they establish a compelling governmental interest. It's why people like Alan West can make the indefinite detention clauses because we have a compelling governmental interest in national security. It's why Michelle Bachman can declare that the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to the federal government because they have a compelling governmental interest in national security. It's why our Republican House can pass things like the Food Safety Modernization Act that put, puts the uh, regulation and security of our farms in the hands of the Department of Homeland Security because they have a compelling governmental interest in national security. So think about this now on the health care level. The Health Care Act is not about health care. It's about health insurance. 
not health care. Okay? So look at this. If you, if you establish, if the government is subsidizing your insurance, in the mind of the government, they're providing you with insurance. Right? That's how it works. A subsidy means a provision. And if they are providing you with health care, that means they have a compelling governmental interest in your health insurance. Which means anything that impacts that health insurance, usage, cost, gives them, they now have a compelling governmental interest in. So they have a compelling governmental interest in your health insurance. That means they have a compelling governmental interest in your health care. Because your health care costs impact your insurance. So if they have a compelling governmental interest in your health insurance and a compelling governmental interest in your health care, they now have a compelling governmental interest in your health. Because your health impacts your health care, which impacts your health insurance. Which means, if you live in a rural area, and you perhaps are 30, 45 minutes from a hospital, it is feasible under this rationale that the government can say, you live too far from a hospital, it impacts our ability to give you health care, costs our insurance way too much, you're raising the cost of our insurance, so you can only live outside a certain radius of a hospital. Okay? Now, if they have a compelling governmental interest in your health, then they have a compelling governmental interest in what you eat. So, you will not be allowed to eat anything that the government has not approved or regulated through the FDA. Which means the tomatoes that you grow in your backyard will be illegal unless you allow the FDA to come in and regulate your garden. And count grow any cows on your own? Goats, chickens, all could be illegal because they impact your health unless you allow the FDA to regulate your home. How do you think this administration feels about the coal and oil industry? Well, guess what? Working in a coal mine negatively impacts your health. And if you live, if you work on an oil rig, it negatively impacts your health. This literally gives the government the power to end entire industries because it negatively impacts your health. This is the declaratory act of our day, giving the government the power to bind us in all cases whatsoever. Nullification is our rightful remedy. Now, we have to talk about this because people are talking about this. Revolution is not our present remedy. Now, I didn't say it wasn't a remedy. I'm just saying it's not our present remedy. You have an inherent right to revolution. It is that right to support and defend your liberty. But that's not what we need to do right now. We should be fighting while we can to maintain the Union and maintain the Constitution. Revolution destroys both. Secession is not our present remedy. It is a, an option for every single state. And the Supreme Court does not have the authority to change that. Because you see, we created the Union on a voluntary basis. The states entered into a contract voluntarily. And if that contract becomes irrevocably broken, then they're not bound by it. And the states have the authority to determine whether the contract is broken or not, because they are the parties to the contract. Secession does not save the Union, although it may save the Constitution, because seceding breaks the Union. But let me tell you something, I'm not a secessionist. I believe the states have the right to do it. I don't think they should. Because we've worked hard, and I like the Constitution. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I'm not a secessionist, I'm an expulsionist. If you don't like the Constitution, you don't like the way it works, get out and form your own socialist country and leave us to what we got. Yeah. But failure to nullify will lead to either of these, if not both, those inevitabilities. This, the representative
Representatives of Virginia, once again, the acquiescence of the states under the infractions of the federal compact will either beget a speedy consolidation, meaning we would no longer be a confederation of independent sovereign countries, but nothing more than subjects to a federal government, by precipitating state governments into impotency and contempt. If the federal government can tell your state what it can and cannot do, what in heaven's name is the purpose of having a state at all? Right. 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 They are irrelevant and impotent. They are subjects to a federal government just like you and I will be. And then he says, or prepare the way for revolution by repetition of these infractions into the people are aroused to appear in the majesty of their strength. You know why? Because when the federal government is supreme over the states and supreme over the people, you are no longer a republic, you are a, a kingdom. And you do not unelect kings. The only way to get rid of a king is to start chopping off heads. So, our founders considered nullification to be the last resort before revolution. And we are the ones that have to do this. Now, nullification is not just a state action. Nullification can be a county action. It can be a municipal action. It should be, it should be the proper perspective of your, of your sheriff. Your sheriff is duty bound by his oath and the power that he has to say, guess what? That's an unconstitutional law and we will not enforce this in my jurisdiction. We have just had that victory. You, you may not know this, but we had a sheriff stand up in Florida, yep. in Liberty County, Florida, and said, conceal and carry permits are unconstitutional. Yeah. If you come to my workshop on Saturday, I'll prove that to you. But conceal and carry permits are unconstitutionally said, and we will not enforce this in my county. Our conservative Republican governor arrested our sheriff, suspended him without pay, and prosecuted him for a completely made-up crime. Something that could, I mean, it was on the books, but it was something that they could not prove. He just went to trial last week and was acquitted. Because your sheriffs do have the power and the authority to say that is unconstitutional and we will not enforce this. So if you don't have a state that's on board with you, and I just came from Minnesota and they don't, that means nullification has to move with staff local. Your sheriff, your county commissioner, your city councilman. And here's the bad news. If you live in a place where these people will not stand in, to, in between you and tyrannical use of power, then you have, the, you have the obligation to nullify. Obligation. You simply stand up and say, I will not comply. I will not comply. Come hell or high water, I will not comply. Now, Thomas Paine said, these are the times that try men's souls, and the summer soldiers and the sunshine patriots will shrink from the service of their country, but those who stand by it now deserve the love and thanks of ages to come. The summer soldiers and the sunshine patriots are not the progressives and the socialists and the communists. The summer soldiers and the sunshine patriots are the people that are sitting in the rooms with you now who will say, you know, I understand this is right, I just can't do it. I gotta keep my job. I gotta keep my house. I gotta, I, I don't wanna cut back on my budget. I don't wanna make that sacrifice. But you see, there is no other choice. Because liberty is not a gift you purchase for yourself. Liberty is something, the liberty that we enjoy has been purchased by men and women who sacrificed for us before us. But the liberty that we squander today is not our own. It belongs to these young people. Sam Adams said, 
If we tamely suffer a lawless attack on liberty, we encourage it. And we involve others in our doom. He said it's a serious consideration that ages and millions yet unborn will be the miserable sharers of our experience. See, if we simply say, you know what, I, I can't go to jail, what we're saying is, is that their liberty is not worth that much. And I'd rather see them in chains and bonds than risk going to jail to fight for what is right. See, it's that sacred honor thing, right? Now, you're going to hit this point, and if you give me just a few more minutes, I'll finish up. You're going to hit this point, and you're going to have to decide, and inevitably, this is going to come to your head. If I stand and nullify, and I go to jail, and I have a trial, and they find me guilty, and I serve my sentence or whatever, it'll all be done, nobody will ever know about it, and I sacrificed all that for nothing. For nothing, because it'll none nothing. And the bottom line, what you're saying is, what can I possibly do as one person to overcome this level of corruption and tyranny? Am I right? Let me tell you what, I'm going to introduce you. What can one man do? Let me introduce you to one man. I'm going to tell you. Ready? This man is a man named James Otis Jr. James Otis Jr. was an attorney who had received the highest post an attorney could get in the colonies. His job was to enforce the laws and prosecute people for the violation of the laws. But James Otis Jr. was a patriot. See, James Otis Jr.'s job was to enforce these things called writs of assistance. Arbitrary, he called them the worst instruments of arbitrary power, the most destructive of English liberty ever found in an English law book. They were handwritten warrants that allowed the government to go into people's homes with no due process, take whatever they wanted, and then prosecute the people in those homes by sending them to Canada to be tried by the French. Read it, it's all in the Declaration of Independence. And James Otis Jr. started feeling conflicted. He said, I cannot do this anymore. He resigned his post and took up a battle against the British government legally. He legally fought them against these writs of assistance. And the moment that he filed that when he filed that lawsuit, the government immediately attacked him, accused him of abandoning his post. Now that's a big deal. When you received a post from the king and you abandon the post, that is treason and you are put to death. He did not abandon his post. He said, I resigned. Not only was he accused of treason, his community ostracized him and the legal community blacklisted him. This is 1760, James Otis Jr. took up this fight all by himself because he said, it's wrong. And he called, told them in his legal argument, you can call me whatever you want, but my liberty is worth more than my name. You see, that's what sacred honor is. Sacred honor is saying, I'm going to do what's right because it's the right thing to do, regardless of whether it's politically advantageous, regardless of the consequences, I am going to do it because it's the right thing to do. And on, in February of 1761, James Otis Jr. stood in that courtroom all by himself and argued for five solid hours against these writs of assistance and lost. But James, but John Adams would write about this day 40 years later. John Adams said, but Otis was a flame of fire with a promptitude of classical illusions, a depth of research, a rapid summary of historical events and dates, a profusion of legal authorities, a prophetic glare of his eyes into the future, and a rapid torrent of impetuous eloquence. He hurried away all before him. 
And then John Adams said, American independence was then and there born. The seeds of patriots and heroes to defend the vigorous youth were then and there sown. John Adams said, every man of an immense crowded audience appeared to go away as I did, ready to take up arms against writs of assistance. He said, then and there was the first scene of the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, the child of independence was born. And in 15 years, he says, in 1776, he grew up to manhood and declared himself free. What can one man do? You will never know, because you will never know who is watching. James Otis Jr. had no idea that in that immense, crowded audience that day were John Adams, Sam Adams, Richard Henry Lee, Patrick Henry, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and many of these men who would declare and bleed and die for our independence. And he did it on that day all by himself. How do you do this? You simply decide what is right and you stand. Because you never know who's going to be watching you. You may be James Otis Jr. that day. You may be the one who James Otis Jr. is watching. You see, our independence was not won by 40-somethings. Our independence was fought by 20-somethings. Noah Webster was 17. Thomas Jefferson, I believe, was in his 20s. Many of them, not uh, much past 30. There's these people who will be the seeds of liberty. But if we teach them that it's better to go along to get along, that has to come from you and me. What can one man do? You will never know, because you never know who's watching. So did I teach you something tonight? This is how you get in touch with me. This is my website, chrisannhall.com. I have a radio show that airs every morning, Monday through Friday, 6 to 7 a.m. Actually, you guys are central time. Do you know how odd that works? <laughs> Just so you know. All right. So you guys are Central Time, so it starts at 5 a.m. for you. Now, you don't have to be up at 5 a.m. You can go to my website and listen to my past shows anytime you want to. You can also find links on my Facebook page. You can get to my Facebook page through my website. All right. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Woo. I, have, I also have a radio show that airs every Sunday from 3 to 4 your time. You can find out how to get in touch with that there on my website. I've also been just recently nationally syndicated. So if you want my morning show on your local station, contact me and I will get you in touch with my syndicator and we will get you set up uh, with the information that you need to petition your radio show, your, your station to get my show on, on the air in your place. Go to my website. You can get in writing the, the lesson that I just taught you today. 